Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Mother of mercy. St. Joseph, Pope St. Pius X, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, there is a story that I love to tell. I've been telling it a lot during this year for priests about uh, Holy Mama Sarto. After the death of Pope Leo XIII in 1903, Giuseppe Cardinal Sarto, the Archbishop of Venice, was elected the new pope and became Pope St. Pius X. Uh, He was a humble man, a humble background, second of ten children, from a very poor family, a small Italian village. And after his election as successor, St. Peter, he made a visit to his family and the old family home, and he was delighted to show his papal ring to his elderly saintly mother. And Mama Sarto admired that ring. She examined it very carefully, and when she finished, uh, she held up her left hand, pointed to her wedding ring, and said to her son, the new Pope, do you see this ring? Remember, without this ring, you would not have that ring. (laughs) You know, I think of my own mother. Uh, My mom was the rock of faith, the only rock of faith in my family. And I always attribute my vocation to my devotion to our Blessed Mother and my love of the Holy Rosary that I learned from my own mother. Um, You know, she had nothing more than a high school education, but she knew her faith and she could defend it. She always had a good comeback, a great answer for any question, any challenge that you might present. So I owe her a great debt of gratitude. Uh, When I was ordained, my mother said to me, now, you don't expect me to call you father, do you? <laughs> I said, oh, no, not you, Mom. You can call me Reverend. <laughs> and then I had to tell her, I had to tell her that it was against canon law to hit a priest. <laughs> well, we've come to our last conference. And the title of this talk is, What Do You Know About Marriage? And I chose this title because that is a question we priests are often asked by liberals, secularists, radical feminists, modernists, atheists, whatever you may choose to call them. And as the other fathers here know very well, sometimes they like to point that question at us like a gun. And over the years, their attitude has been something like this. What do you know about marriage and sex? You're a priest. You're a male celibate. Who are you to try to tell us anything? Well, now, almost a half a century after the start of the so-called sexual revolution, anyone who would be intellectually honest can look back with 2020 hindsight and see the massive, massive social and moral disintegration we have for the whole Western world, the rampant divorce, The infidelity, the explosion of sexually transmitted diseases, family breakup and all the emotional and psychological devastation that goes with that, the cohabitation, the rate of which is up 900% in that time, same-sex unions, the serial polygamy, etc., all the things that Pope Paul VI, in his 1968 letter to the world, Humani Vitae, prophetically predicted would be the rotten fruits, the dire consequences of the contraceptive mentality and free sex. Now, I think we ought to be asking the seculars the same question. What do you know about marriage? What do you know 
about the nature, the purpose, the essential properties of the married state, the answer to that is abundantly clear. It is little or nothing. A while back I saw a front page article in the New Orleans newspaper and I was down there and the headline was, in the U.S., I don't has now replaced I do. Married couples are the new minority. And I'll read you uh, a couple paragraphs from that article. Married couples whose numbers have been declining for decades as a proportion of American households have finally slipped into a minority. The American Community Survey, released this month by the Census Bureau, found that 49.7% of the nation's 111 million households were made up of married couples with and without children just shy of a majority. Married couples are the new minority. And uh, the article rightly acknowledges the fact this is a sociological time bomb. Brothers and sisters, do you understand all of us have a most grave obligation to defend the cause and the sanctity of marriage? With the possible exception of the church, marriage is the most attacked, denigrated, undermined institution on the face of this earth. That should not surprise anyone. In the news just about every day there are the sensational scandals, the Hollywood celebrities who change spouses like they change cars or old clothes. The ugly divorces and custody battles, the sitcoms that mock marriage and family life, uh, the afternoon soaps that are a veritable celebration of marital infidelity, adultery, fornication, divorce American style. A while back I saw a cover story in a women's magazine celebrating Mother's Day about a model, an actress, who they lauded, praised to the skies as a role model of a modern wife and mother. At that time, she was working on her third marriage. Come to find out later, she has divorced her fourth husband, and it got ugly. There was a media feeding frenzy over Britney Spears' first marriage, which lasted all of 55 hours. (laughs) They asked the ex-husband, whose name nobody can remember, what went wrong, and he said he thought... It was just a joke gone too far. Well, I think the same thing can be said of marriage in general of the American pop culture. It has become a joke gone too far. Recently, a well-known talk show host said on the air that marriage was invented in the Middle Ages and it was all about money. It's all about dowries. Poor families needed money and marriage was the way to get it. Incredibly stupid, but nobody challenged it. Every day, every single day, the traditional understanding of marriage as an indissoluble union, a permanent, exclusive union between one man and one woman for the purpose of the procreation and upbringing of children and mutual love and support, is under attack in the media, the news and entertainment medias, the courts, the legislatures, the universities, the public schools. Same-sex marriage, the oxymoron known as gay marriage, is now on the horizon. Attempts in Congress to pass federal legislation to ban it have failed. San Francisco homosexual activist and writer Michelangelo Signorio says the goal of homosexuals is to, quote, fight for same-sex marriage and its benefits and then, once granted, redefine the institution of marriage completely to demand the right to marry not as a way of adhering to society's moral codes, but rather to debunk a myth and radically alter an archaic institution. The most subversive action lesbians and gay men can undertake is to transform the notion of family entirely. End quote. That's what they're saying. They mean what they say. This character was on CNN. Here's the objective. Redefine the institution of marriage completely transform the notion of family entirely. And friends, don't think it's going to end there. One same-sex marriage gains widespread acceptance. What do you think would be the next debacle in the downhill slide in the social and moral chaos? It will be polygamy. Polygamy. The 
doesn't take a moral theologian to figure that out. They're already talking about this on TV. So everywhere there is the attempt to redefine marriage, but you can't redefine marriage because God has already defined it for all time. Listen, the far left is going to wreak havoc with all this for a time. And I'll make you a prediction. The church is going to be sorely persecuted over this issue. As at some point in time, I believe the state will step in to attempt to regulate marriage and enforce that regulation on the churches. It's coming. But there's an old saying, the mills of God grind slowly. That which is against God and nature will fail. In the end, it will fail. But we're going to have a heck of a fight on our hands, I guarantee you. The Catholic Church, along with other faiths that profess belief in the one God, hold the essential truth that marriage is from God. God himself is the author of marriage. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 1603, says this. The vocation of marriage is written in the very nature of man and woman as they come from the hand of the Creator. The teaching, of course, goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. The beginning, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 says, That is why a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, and the two of them become one body. That is God's plan from the beginning. Something went wrong along the way. Of course, it was sin. Sin came into the world, things got distorted. In the ancient world there was polygamy, men with many wives. Moses permitted divorce because of the hardness of men's hearts. Why would Moses have done such a thing? Well, in those brutal ancient times, men who wanted to get rid of their wives could find far worse ways to do it than divorce. But Jesus came to restore everything to God's original plan. He said from the beginning it was not so. He came to restore marriage to its original dignity in God's plan for us, one man and one woman with God for life. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, The supreme gift of marriage is a human person. The supreme gift of marriage is a human person. Let me ask you something. We get to the heart of the issue. You ever hear somebody criticize someone else and say that that person thinks that he or she is God's gift? Do you know, do you recognize the fact that if you're married, you really are supposed to be God's gift to someone else? First of all, to your spouse and also to your family? Do you realize the fact that your spouse is God's gift to you? Are you abusing that gift by being cold, critical, unkind, unloving? unforgiving, unaffectionate, inattentive toward the spouse that God gave you so that you can love and be loved? Do you understand that God expects your marriage to be a living example, a living reflection of the eternal love between Christ and his church? Is your marriage really an accurate representation of the love between Christ and his church, or is it a perverted, distorted one to the people around you, especially to your own kids? I believe that this issue, the issue of marriage, will be one of the defining issues of our time. And if America lands on the wrong side of this issue, our country may not survive. And you know, at times even Catholics will say to us, Well, you're a priest. What does a priest know about marriage? Well, if you're a priest of the Latin Rite, as we are, chances are you know nothing by experience. But I know what God has to say about it. God wrote the book. God is the author of marriage and human sexuality and human life. And as always, the essential problem in marriage and family life is that people think they know a better way than the one God established. The great dogmatic theologian, Father John Harden, whose cause for canonization has now been introduced in Rome, used to say, this is the problem. 
We tell God to go away and mind his own divine business. Marriage is God's business. Instituted by God, part of the order of his creation, and it has been raised, elevated to the dignity of a sacrament by his son, our Lord Jesus Christ himself. For decades, ad nauseum, we have been hearing dissenting Catholics say, They want the church out of their private lives. They want the church out of their sex lives. They want the church out of their bedrooms. They've got things all fouled up. The church only upholds what God teaches. God is everywhere. (laughs) You can hide behind locked doors. You can hide under the covers. You can hide under the bed. But you can't hide from God. God wrote the book. And as the old saying goes, when all else fails, go back and read the instructions. Friends, the defense of marriage has got to be at the forefront of our minds. The state of marriage and family life is everybody's business. Everybody's welfare depends upon it. Clergy or laity, Catholic or non-Catholic, Christian or non-Christian, everybody has got a stake in this precisely because people's Nations, cultures, and civilizations stand or fall, live or die on the state of marriage and the life of the family, and there's no doubt about it. History has proven time and time again, no great civilization has ever survived the downfall of the institution of marriage and the ruin of family life, not one. Marriage is the foundation of the family. The family is the foundation of society. That is why the church will always have a major stake in the life and health of the family. We call the family the Ecclesia Domestica, the domestic church after the theological thought of the great St. Augustine. In this day and age, the spiritual battle that we're in, I think it's going to be the case very often that the domestic church will have to become like the domestic fortress. The bastion of faith in a world gone mad. The domestic church will have to become like the domestic oasis in a spiritual desert. It will have to become like the domestic garden to bear good fruit in the midst of a spiritually, morally contaminated environment with the toxic waste dump of the American pop culture. The domestic church will have to become sometimes like the domestic monastery for the preservation of the faith for the barbarians at the gates. Where the family is concerned, the barbarians are not just at the gate, they're coming into our homes through the TV set, the internet. Pope John Paul II, in his apostolic letter, Familiaris Consortio, the role of the family in the modern world, said this. The most fundamental mission for the church is the renewal of family life. The family must be the lived image of the Blessed Trinity. In the church, the family ought to be a place where the gospel is transmitted and from which the gospel radiates to other families and to the whole of society. The church is an immense family on a mission, mission of life and love. We are living in a moment in history in which the family is the object of numerous forces that seek to destroy it. So you see, Satan always has a very simple plan of attack. Divide and conquer. Right? Destroy marriages, destroy families, destroy families, destroy souls. Drag as many souls down into hell as possible. That's why the devil is always trying to drive the wedge. I use the, the imagery, the analogy of the wedge. One blow at a time, little by little. To divide the spouses. Divide and conquer. Hmm? He'll drive that wedge through pride, selfishness, envy, impatience, anger, infidelity, lack of charity. He will use any and all means possible to wreck a home and family. And right now, friends, he is literally doing a hell of a job. I wonder if you're aware of the fact that adultery is by far the leading cause of marital and family breakup in the U.S. 
I heard one good Catholic counselor say that in our, quote, sexually liberated society, adultery has become as commonplace as picking up a newspaper. Hmm? One of my favorite bishops, Bishop Thomas Doran of the Diocese of Rockford, Illinois, great bishop, no-nonsense kind of guy, minces no words. I heard him say in a talk that he gave there, that adultery has become so commonplace that it has now taken on the status of an indoor sport in this country. God help us. Adultery is a cold-blooded killer. It kills marital love. It kills mutual trust between spouses. It kills the life of grace in souls. It is not just the sin of lust. It is also a grave sin of injustice toward the spouse who is betrayed. It is also an act of betrayal. Now, psychologist and family therapist Frank Pittman says this. Adultery is the primary disruptor of families and the most dreaded and devastating experience in marriage. And I want you to understand this also. Guys, you especially. The use of pornography constitutes a form of adultery. Infidelity. I have a friend, he's a young canon lawyer, who works in a diocesan marriage tribunal, and he was telling me that he really has been astonished just amazed at the number of marriages that are being destroyed by pornography. It is deadly. I shouldn't have to tell you why, what the effect of that is between a husband and a wife. Hmm? But that having been said, couples remember this. One of the devil's favorite tricks and primary objectives is to get you fighting with each other. To get you at each other's throats. And if he can't use the big things to get you stirred up, he'll use the little things, lesser things, sometimes petty things. And if the two of you don't pray together, if God is not the third partner in your marriage, he will set you up for it, especially if you make the fatal mistake of expecting perfection from your spouse. You know, I'm always amazed at some of the things that Couples are ready to go to war over. Hmm? The things that couples claim that they are not able to work out. Hmm? You know, I'm sick of cleaning up after him. He's always a mess. She runs up a little too big a bill in the credit card. The in-laws are mean. They're nasty to me and I'll take it out on you. She put on a little weight. Years go by. She's not quite so pretty anymore. <laughs> Neither is he. <laughs> There's not enough money coming in. There's not enough money to keep me in the lifestyle that I have become accustomed to. He or she is not living up to my expectations. He had a bad day. He said the wrong thing. She had a bad day. She said the wrong thing. There's constant criticism, complaining, fault-finding, nitpicking. You're never satisfied. Neither one will apologize. Then comes the dreaded cold shoulder. You don't talk to each other. There's no affection. Sex can be used as a weapon, a tool for manipulation or punishment. There's no more heart-to-heart conversation between husband and wife. Pride kicks in. Pride is a killer. A deadly, deadly poison in marriage. The devil counts on pride and plays on pride. Spouses eventually become rivals to each other. Then they become strangers to each other. The fire of spousal love begins to go out. Eventually, it grows cold. Emotional love dies. Then, charity is abandoned Christian love goes out the window. And you look back on it all and you wonder how in the world it could ever have happened. You see, it doesn't have to be the big things that wreck your marriage. Little things will do if you let them. 
If you do not make God the third partner in your marriage, if you do not cooperate with the grace of the sacrament, with it, with God, together you can overcome any obstacle without it. Molehills are made into mountains and you trip and fall over them just the same. Then what happens? Sick marriages make sick souls. Dysfunctional marriages produce wounded souls. Wounded souls are vulnerable at the mercy of many different kinds of temptations. Wounded souls suffer, fall away. Wounded souls are in danger of being spiritually lost. All this means, very simply, that any way that you look at it, marriage is a matter of life or death. At some point in time, friends, we've got to stand and face the fact that we have a disastrous situation in this country in regard to marriage and family life. It began in earnest with the coming of the so-called sexual revolution of the 1960s, in which the divinely established link, the divinely ordained link between marriage and human sexuality, marriage, human sexuality, and human life was broken, severed. At that time, there was the acceptance of the playboy mentality. Then, the acceptance of the contraceptive mentality. Recreational sex became the norm. Contraception was the enabler, the gas on the fire of the sexual revolution. Free love meant free sex. Sex became so much fun and games. Get all that you can any way that you can. The mass media, especially the entertainment media, trivializes marriage. 80% of the sexual relationships depicted on television and in the movies are outside of marriage. Look at the stats. They prove the point every time. A recent Gallup poll showed that 70% of American Catholics approve of divorce. The divorce rate is still hovering at about 50%. 80%, according to Psychology Today magazine, for the couples that live together before marriage. The leading cause of divorce, again, is adultery. Second leading cause, alcoholism, substance abuse. Third leading cause, Arguments over money. Greed. In the year 1964, there were about 400 applications for annulments in the church in the United States. Today, today, more than 50,000 a year. That's what the statisticians tell us. What does the Bible tell us? At the root of it all, at the heart of it all, is pride, egotism, lust, promiscuity, selfishness, godlessness. All too many a Christian home is a house divided, divided by inflexibility, stubbornness, lack of love, lack of kindness, lack of compassion, lack of generosity, no willingness to sacrifice for the good of the other, each spouse thinking he or she knows better than the other, spouses totally unconcerned with the rights and welfare of the other or their children. And then, of course, There is what I believe to be ultimately the greatest single cause of the destruction of marriages, and that is pride, lack of forgiveness. Lack of forgiveness. The inability to say, I'm sorry. The inability to apologize in humility. And all this, friends, is precisely why marriage has got to be a sacrament. It imparts a necessary, indispensable grace so that you can be faithful to your state in life. And you can't do without it. The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. The pressures, the hardships, the temptations of modern living are far too great if you don't cooperate with that grace. And the grace of the sacrament helps you to see that no matter how big you think your problems are, God has the answer. God is always, always calling us back to the gospel of Jesus Christ who said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. You know, yesterday I talked about the great virtue of humility. The foundation of all virtue. Sometimes healing 
Reconciliation in marriage is nothing more than having the humility to recognize the fact that your problems are bigger than you are. That God has the answer. You need help and God is going to provide it when you turn to him in prayer. When you make the time and the effort to find a good Catholic counselor. A good spiritual director. When you take the time together, say, to make a retro of our weekend. Or take part in a marriage encounter. It can be done. God never asks the impossible of you. In the Psalms it says, with God I can break through any barrier. With God I can scale any wall. Now, I wanted this talk to be kind of like a basic course, a crash course in the theology of marriage. To do that, we got to go back to the basics. right? Everywhere that I go, whether it be a retreat or a parish mission, I am talking about the nature, the essential properties the vital importance of marriage to the church and to the world. It's got to be defended with all of our strength. So we go back to the basics and reflect upon what our Lord had to say about marriage. First of all this, the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus responds to this question put to him by the Pharisees. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause, whatever? Our Lord's response in verse 4. Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, no human being must separate. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, Unless the marriage is unlawful and marries another, commits adultery. Some are incapable of marriage because they're born so. Some because they're made so by others. Some because they have renounced marriage for the sake of the kingdom of God. That last statement, of course, is the biblical foundation for priestly celibacy, consecrated virginity. But based on our Lord's infallible words, what is God telling us about marriage? With a single exception of your relationship with God and the salvation of your soul, nothing in your life can be more important than your marriage. Not your job, not your career, not your money, not your possessions, not your sports, not your hobbies, not your friends, not your boss. After God, your first responsibility is to your spouse for the sake of your family. And that is why... The best thing a man can do for his kids is to love their mother. That's why the best thing a woman can do for her kids is to love their dad. Love your spouse. Walk with God. Get each other to heaven. That's what it's all about. Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to say, it takes three to get married. A man, a woman, and God. God to bless them, strengthen them, protect them, hold them together, and hold their family together. So, a true marriage is from God. Not the state, not the church, not the spouses alone, but ultimately God. That is why marriage is for life, till death do you part. Intended by God, by its nature, to be permanent for the baptized. For Christians, marriage will always be a sacred covenant. A sacred family bond before God, and the key word is covenant. Not just a contract, not just an agreement, not just an arrangement that can be broken if things don't, quote, work out. I'm always astonished at the kind of distorted attitude that so many people enter into marriage with. You know, I would venture to say it may well be the case that most young people today enter into marriage with the idea, at least the subconscious idea, that the door is always open. They're entering into a marriage on some kind of a trial basis. And, you know, their attitude is, if things don't go my way, if the going gets tough, if something or someone better comes along, I'm out of here. 
That attitude does not make for a valid consent to marriage. There's the common misconception today that a happy, successful marriage is a valid marriage and an unhappy, unsuccessful marriage is an invalid one. Not so. Christian marriage, validly contracted, consummated by sexual union, can never be dissolved. Why? Why has marriage got to be permanent? Precisely because marriage is the divinely ordained channel through which God brings human life into the world. The marital act involves the transmission of human life. And human life is sacred and made in the image and likeness of God the Creator. When God gives human life, he gives it forever. God directly creates the human soul and infuses that immortal soul into the human body at the moment of conception. He brings every human soul into the world with an eternal destiny. You don't have to be at a higher pay grade to get this, if you know what I mean. Marriage is permanent because the fruit of marital love, human life itself, is also permanent and it has got to be morally, socially, legally protected. The good of the spouses, the good of the children, the survival of the family, the good of society demands that marriage be a lifelong, unbreakable covenant. Now, people ask me very often about the question of annulments in the church. This has to be understood. An annulment is not, I say again, is not a Catholic divorce. The proper term is declaration of nullity. When a declaration of nullity is issued... It means that in the sight of the church, no valid marriage existed to begin with because of some grave defect, defect in intention, or maybe a grave impediment of some kind. Hmm? Now, I realize that over the years, the system has been grossly abused in many dioceses where applications for annulments have been rubber stamped Right? Without due consideration. Right? Without considering the guidelines, the norms established by the church. But it is the case often that an annulment is necessary and legitimate. Right? For some of the reasons that I have stated here. And, of course, the high rate of divorce, you know, in any culture, with such a high rate of marital and family breakup, um, the fabric of society will start to unravel, usually within two generations. Um, that should make sense to you. We know that the greatest and uh, the highest of all the virtues is charity. Charity, simply put, is loving the way that God loves. It's God's way of loving. So what is love in a truly Christian sense? Here's a good working definition. Of, keep it in mind, you'll never go wrong. Right? Love means wanting what is truly the best for your neighbor. Wanting what is truly best for the people that you love. What could be better than God? What could be better than heaven? Perfect eternal happiness in God's heavenly kingdom in the beatific vision. That is why the first essential thing God wants spouses to do for each other and for their kids is to help them get to heaven. Scripture could not put it any more simply or clearly. God is love. Deus caritas est. Right? That's the greatest love of all. We all know that. God is love. But most people will never consider the fact that there are some things that God hates. There are some things that God truly detests. How do we know that? The Bible tells us so. Okay, the verses that we're concerned with here uh, are from the book of the prophet Malachi, chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. God says this, The altar of the Lord you cover with tears, weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards your sacrifice or accepts it favorably from your hand. And you say, why is it? Because the Lord is witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have broken faith, though she is your companion, your betrothed wife. Did he not make one being with flesh and spirit? What does that one require but godly offspring? You must then safeguard life that is your own, 
not break faith with the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. And God repeats himself in verse 16. You must then safeguard life that is your own and not break faith. God loves everybody, but God hates divorce because divorce wrecks the lives of the people that he loves. I hate divorce, says the Lord thy God. Divorce is a killer. It breaks faith, it breaks families, it breaks hearts. It is the cause of untold suffering, emotional and mental anguish for millions of people whose lives will never be the same. Now we realize that often it can be the case that divorce is inevitable and even necessary. But there are millions of good people who have had divorce forced upon them through no fault of their own. They live with the heartache of it for the rest of their lives. In the book of Sirach it says, Worst of all wounds is that of the heart. In the book of Jeremiah it says, More torturous than all else is the human heart beyond all remedy. Who can stand it? I've spoken to people who have been through a nasty divorce who have told me that it was such a terribly painful experience for them that for a time they wanted to die. They actually prayed for death. Often the heartache lasts a lifetime. What happens to the kids become the children of the divorce? How often do the kids end up emotionally, psychologically scarred for life? Call them middle of hellacious battles in the home? Put in the center of ugly, nasty custody battles or visitation rights? They end up being bounced back and forth between one parent and the other like human ping pong balls. Sometimes the emotional strain the psychological wounds are so deep and so lasting it carries over later into life to the point at which the children of divorce and a family breakup are at a distinct psychological and moral disadvantage trying to have a happy and stable marriage and family life themselves. Because all they have ever known is instability. As the old saying, you can't give what you haven't got. In my seminary days, we had a professor, good old Redemptor's priest, was teaching the theology and marriage and human sexuality. And he used to describe marriage, the spirituality of sacramental marriage like this. He would say marriage has got to be total, mutual, self-giving with openness to come what may. Total, mutual, self-giving with openness to come what may. That, of course, was a big part of Pope John Paul II's teaching on the spirituality of marriage, part of the essence of his theology of the body, the concept of self-donation, sacrificial self-giving, the key to peace in the divine will, sometimes means the way of the cross, precisely because one loves to the extent that one is willing to suffer for the ones who are loved. Total mutual self-giving with openness to come what may. And the come what may is loving acceptance of God's will no matter how it presents itself in your life. In other words, the test of true love is going to come in the come what may's of life. For example, in the self-giving love that it takes to be open to the gift of life. Maybe, maybe having one more child, welcoming one more soul for the kingdom of God. It can mean... Bearing up with the debilitating disease of your spouse. It can mean putting up with the frustrating, exasperating faults of a husband or a wife. It can mean helping each other through the hard times, getting each other to heaven. In his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, the Apostle St. Paul said this, Be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives should be subordinate to their husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, just as Christ is head of the church. He himself the savior of the body. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her. So also, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and the church. Now, let me make a couple of quick points here before I close about Ephesians chapter 5, 
This is God's plan for marriage and the proper relationship between husband and wife as it relates to the relationship between Christ and his church. Number one, wives. And this is another one of those hard sayings, right? <laughs> um, please have the humility to accept the fact that God calls husbands and fathers to be the heads of their households. First, in the order of authority. Don't try to take that responsibility away from him. Unless he abdicates it. His primary responsibility is awesome before God. And he is going to have to render a strict account to God if he fails to carry out that responsibility in faith, in prayer, and in charity. And remember, that word subordination used in scripture is not a dirty word. Subordination does not mean inferiority. Remember that our Lord spent 30 years of his life in the Holy Family at Nazareth. He was subordinate to Our Lady and to St. Joseph. You see? Now, number two, husbands. The Apostle says, Love your wives as Christ loved his church. How did Jesus love his church? He died for her. He died for her. Now, fellas, chances are you are never going to be called upon to literally have to die for your wife. Right? You're never going to have to jump on a hand grenade to save her. Chances are nobody is ever going to point a shotgun to you and say, Okay, pal, who's it going to be? You or her? Right? No. Um, dying for her will be far more simple than that. Dying for her will often mean nothing more than this. Dying to yourself. Dying to being stuck in your own ways. Dying to your pride, your critical spirit. Dying to anger, bitterness, resentment toward her, caustic criticism, insults, lack of kindness, lack of consideration and all the like. It means basically this. Listen. <laughs> dying for her is going to mean dying to sin. It's going to mean being the holy man that God wants you to be, the man that she needs you to be. A good reflection for Father's Day, huh? I believe that in the years to come, God may call upon some of us here to become heroes, maybe even martyrs for the cause of marriage. St. John Chrysostom, great father and doctor of the church, had a simple definition of marriage that has stood the test of time. He said, marriage is one man and one woman with God for life. To that I will add, with total mutual self-giving, with openness to come what may. And that, friends, is what you ought to answer when they ask you the question, what do you know about marriage? Praise her, praise her.